Good afternoon, everybody. How are you doing? It is Thursday again at the earlier time of noon Pacific time, three o'clock Eastern. And uh, in Sweden, I don't know what time it is yet, but we're going to get to that in just a second. Um, before we go on, welcome. It's been a minute. Um, thanks for, for dropping in. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, please uh, hit the subscribe button and hit that little alarm bell. You'll get notified whenever we go live in the future. Uh, this is a, a really cool thing we've been doing for about a year now. Um, and it's uh, we, we have a lot of fun. We, we plan to continue this for the long term. So thanks for joining us. Now, let's get into things. Today's guest, I'm very excited about this one. Um, I want to welcome, let me bring him in real quick, Mr. Christian Matson. How are you, sir? I'm good, thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh, you're, you're very welcome. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, David here, as always, from uh, Buenos Aires, Argentina, hey. and uh, Christian hey. over in Sweden. So once again, the internet wins on on what we're capable of doing uh, now. Christian, what time is it there? It's uh, 8 p.m. 8 p.m. There we go. Perfect. All right. Um, for those of you that uh, don't know Christian, maybe he's otherwise known as the tallest man on earth. Um, he was a former frontman of the Montezumas uh, and went solo in 2006, where he has been bringing his uh, very energetic performances around the world. Uh, ever since. He plays guitar, he plays piano, but probably most importantly, he plays banjo. And very well, he plays banjo too. Um, so I think at this point, uh, welcome to the show. We're, we're really, really uh, privileged to have you here, and thanks for joining us. Could you play us a little song to get started? I think let's, let's go there. I can try. Awesome. Sounds great. Yeah, sounds Fantastic. Great. Fantastic. Thank you. I'm because getting into it. It's always a little <laughs> trick to play to the computer. It just 
it's not as cute as the people in, in the crowd. You know, it's pretty square. So <laughs> start to, yeah, it's, it's fun. fun. Is you. there a trick you use to try to to try to get into the into the spot? You know, into the moment when you're when you're you know playing to nobody like that. Is there any sort of mental game you do? No, I don't. I'm really maybe it's through this this for a year now, but I painfully realized like what you know how much I needed the the audience to you know I don't know what it is psychologically. You just want to like you know, impress someone, or flirt with someone, or you just, you just need that little thing, and then suddenly you can like play better. And now it's just like I don't know, it feels like a driving school test or something. We take the driver's license. I don't know. But yeah, it's, all, it's, it's sterile. It's it's, it's 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 tricky. It's a tricky thing. Yeah. But it's a beautiful but, uh, thing too. I'm not. I'm sorry. I'm not sounding like complaining. That is just like self. I'm just like kind of trying to take the um, the level down of my. The, I'm losing English. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> well. Uh, How'd you first start playing music? When? How old were you? And what? What was your? Um, what was your first instrument? Well, my first instrument was probably like there was a bunch of stuff around the house. There was, there was a piano, a guitar. Mm -hmm. I was really into from a young age. Just like messing with tape recorders, cassettes, and stuff, and like making noise and like and messing them up so like i had a tape recorder that could feed back it was some broken so it could make like like theremin sounds wow. just doing that mostly making noise but then i started to play the clarinet i still play the clarinet uh and then so it started because in sweden we can take individual uh instrument classes in school from a young age which is great uh but then I figured out that I wanted to play guitar, of course. So then I started playing guitar around I was 12 years old, maybe. And then right. play the play classical guitar because it was it we had to do in school. And then, you know, the friends who, you know, got into punk rock and all that in the teenage years. And, and since then, I've just been playing a lot. <laughs> And you kind of you, you know you go back between playing electric guitar and playing acoustic instruments and what kind of what kind of drove you to kind of getting really into deeper into the the you know the tr traditional acoustic instruments such as the banjo um the, the banjo is actually a really good good example of what kind of, because it was the banjo and I mean, banjo i've been playing on and off just took a took a long time for me to get the, my hands on a really on a, on a decent banjo because they're I used to come by in Sweden. But there was something about finding uh, open tunings on acoustic guitars and just like hearing like Skip James and most mostly Skip James sounding like that's from space. Like that is not. It's just like if it something it just like resonated in me. It was just. All the little weird, like all of us probably feel weird. We're probably all narcissistic, so we feel like I am weirder than anyone else. But I felt I felt this like connection to the weirdness in that. It was just so special to hear like Skip James play in like a D minor tuning and then just going back and forth from D major and D minor and just like that was so cool. And just dove into that. And I felt kind of the same when I heard because it was around the same time I've been listening. You know, found Bob Dylan in my teens, and just listened to it all the time. And there was the beauty of the MP3 blogs and the, like the early internet, where all these bootlegs were going around. So I figured out what Bob Dylan had listened to, and we had this great library in Lexham, where I'm from, where they had a bunch of roots music CDs that you could borrow. So I borrowed them, but then I heard I heard Bascom and Laura Lunsford playing. Mole in the ground, and I heard Roscoe Holcomb play the banjo, and the banjo it kind of triggered the same thing in me because of like the five string banjo, and not so much the bluegrass banjo, but uh, it, the Scruggs style, love that too. 
Love that too. Just doesn't work with my brain to play it. But Clawhammer banjo and singing with Clawhammer banjo, it just sounded so, because I didn't grow, didn't grow up with it around here. It's not part of uh, Swedish folk music. So I could just like, and I would have been playing in, in in punk rock and garage rock bands where it was just like that kind of you know, freedom to do like the world got huge because you could just like turn off the amp and this was kind of the same thing you just like go into these like weird things that happen when you put like a really thin string on top and just like you i don't know i don't know i think it's i i, I really i really love the banjo i love the banjo so much and i couldn't get a hold of a banjo or was living so i i built a banjo or i, I took a, a little toyish acoustic guitar steel strong and i made it one string shorter so it was i had, I had the drone string and i built this it's super ugly i still have it at my parents you should find it but i built this like like a resonator from like a, a metal bowl was here so it, it was basically like a dope a dobro or a resonator guitar with a with a banjo neck but it was great that because then i could get the you know this hand down even though it sounded pretty crappy but i learned a lot from that and then I bought like a Chinese made like a resonator banjo. I took the resonator off. Used it as a first B and <laughs> hurt myself on those flanges that were they were just like not they were really sharp, ruined a lot of sweaters, but I still have that here actually. Um, okay, I'm going down nostalgia lane. But that's fantastic. Yeah. That's I mean you can tell you have you have a had a passion for for playing music. I mean, you're, you're building your own instrument and 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 just trying to learn more and more and digging deeper and deeper, right? Yeah, it's just it was just and also that I hadn't cr grown up with uh, that kind of music. It was just like this world. I was like my very curious person. I could just dive into that universe, and I feel like I, I'm still doing that. So, how did you learn to play? Um, did you do? Started straight on playing claw hammer when you're playing banjo styles, yeah. even yeah. on that homemade instrument. So how'd yeah. you how'd you learn? Did you have books or was it videos or things online videos? Was it were they even that thing? I mean, the, YouTube was was, was around, I'm not a hundred years old, but YouTube was around. So there was, there was some, <laughs> some, there's some videos and like remember there was like pretty bad quality rip where they ripped the like the Mike Seeger. Yeah. VHS cassettes. Where he was like, "Oh, what is that?" Or DVD or VHS. The homespun like, tapes. Yeah. Yeah, the home home, and you could go on the homespun tapes website and see. <laughs> you could see like little. I didn't have a bunch of money, so I just couldn't like I didn't buy those DVDs. But you could see like a little trailer for the the different instruction videos, and then you could like, oh, you can just watch that trailer over and over, and you just, at least you got like some something down so i just watched some of that and then i then i listened and then but then i listened to so many because there were so it was so many th i'm grateful that it was confusing to just it was like what's that guy's name buell cassi is that his name um played east virginia i just had all these mp3s and cds that i was listening to and everyone was just playing like claw hammer or up picking or just made up stuff so it was like what some people were in like doc doc box i love doc box because it was i had it was like no way to figure out how to play that because it was so strange it was playing in d tunings but not playing in d so you had the the drone string be really uh, dissonant towards them, yeah. So yeah, I, just, I, just, I just try to, just try to stick into that, but I also am a person who I am not one to, I, I start to learn something, like learn how to play, like Mike, see you play that, but then I don't go all the way and learn it note by note, and it's going to sound like that in the end. Like halfway, I kind of stare off, and I just try to write a song in that. You know, and so I'm never going to become like a pro on any instrument because I I do see it as you know it's there's songwriting tools, and I 
I, I start to, to play these like traditional songs, but then like it's really nice to throw in a fourth chord here and there, and then you know we can, can use the we can use like the more minor chords and like it from because I'm also I'm from Sweden, so we're just you know we dip down to tub of pop music, but uh, so it's kind of in our veins here. So we want to hear a verse and a chorus. So yeah, I think that's a great the way you approach the traditional music and kind of not having to be make having to recreate it exactly note for note is a great um path because a lot of a lot of people go down that path and try to play everything note for note but they never they never um can kind of e express anything of their own out so you, you you sounds like you had enough respect of the of the music to really dig into it but then how you kind of veered off and used it as a songwriting tool is a so you could express yourself and not just be a, re a recreation sort of you know person. Yeah, because I, I mean, I guess I, you know, I was maybe ignorant, but I was just had felt like I had the freedom because I, I didn't have any relatives like in the Appalachian Mountains, or I didn't, so I didn't, I didn't see it as a to to, to carry on a, a tradition, or because there's a lot of people around that time when I started that you know they they dressed up asked like old time people and and was very like um uh, what's that word everything was just like it was just you, you play the old songs you look like the old and nothing wrong with that it's just like mm -hmm. but i just saw it like this is this is just like other tools to write songs and i saw it, i i didn't see like skip james with the guitar or roscoe holcomb just like kind of yelling and i'm playing band just like i didn't see that as something Oh, it, it kind of sounded futuristic to me. It's just like it's or just or just timeless in a in a crazy like oh there are, there are more crazy people out there. So. <laughs> what were some of the hurdles that you when you're learning banjo that you remember you kind of struggled with um, in your playing and and, and kind of how did you overcome them, especially with limited you know access to a teacher an in-person teacher and i think my playing you know has suffered from not having uh, good uh, teachers and me cutting corners here and there because i do feel like my my left hand is not too great i mean and there's is you know the people who can play like jigs and reels and stuff and there's great i found that I still i mean i find that on guitar too but i guess what everyone else struggles with in the beginning we're just to get the to get the right hand down but it's the same for me it's just been the same as on and guitar i'm not like i don't pick it up like that or in, in the beginning at least it's just like thousands of hours of repetitive training of just doing stuff like that so to get like the the drop yeah the drop thumb or whatever it's just like it was yeah hard in the beginning and now it's just kind of what i do all the time because i really love that you can get get syncopation in there like from more modern music i don't know i it was i don't know I, sorry it's not an answer to your question i just didn't a specific thing it was just hard it was just weird and hard in the beginning but i also i enjoy that right i really enjoy like i still do that like with with guitar and banjo but I've been playing a lot of guitar lately. We're just like, I get this idea in my head what I want to play, and I hear something, and I try to play it, and there's like, there's no way in hell I can start for cursing um, to pick that right now. But I know that if I just spend the time, that if I just, because it's just, it's just little muscles, and not so much to, I don't believe it's the brain that should learn it. Just you need, you need to learn how to disconnect the brain to think because not to you know go into that territory but i think there's a lot of things we can do we can do it if we just like allow ourselves to do them but i think it's yeah and did you practice a lot with with the metronome or or some sort of rhythmic you know no, I should, that's what that's what i'm doing now I'm, i am <laughs> Very late in my career, I started to practice with a metronome because I'm, maybe as you can hear now, because I talk so much, 
but I'm also just excited to talk to you guys that I am rhythmically like in a band, I'm in the I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm in the front seat. I'm not I'm not, mm-hmm. not a good bass player or a drummer because I can't I can't pull back I'm like that. So and with banjo, that's it's just really easy to play too fast. Something that I've felt a lot of times playing live because of all the adrenaline in in, in the body. So things feel that they're 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 good tempo. I feel like it sounds great. And then I hear recording, it just sounds like it's double tempo because you're like you're on another level. So no, I didn't practice with a metronome in the beginning, which I should have. Uh, but I think I just like with other instruments, you learn a couple of chords and then just playing them over and over while doing like different different patterns and just very boring and very annoying for uh, partners that I've had reference that I had now. And when did you start using your, you know, in the opening song, you're, you're, you know, uh, using your foot as, as your metronome. Have you been doing that for a while? Um, yeah. I mean, I, I guess I, now I have, I've been living in these uh, Swedish clogs. <laughs> They're really good for tapping. Yeah. Right. Yes. I, 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 I use my, I, I use my feet, not so much live. I play, uh stages where it doesn't i'm right i want to i was trying just before the pandemic to, to play and to get back to playing smaller venues and do more nights because to get that intimacy and then you could probably actually hear the foot so. on that opening piece you uh went up the neck some you know yeah. but it didn't sound like you were it didn't sound like as though you're playing really um what kind of chord forms were you using on there? Were you just because it wasn't just a single note? It was, it was, it was but it yeah, sounded like there were open strings in there. Yeah, I'm in the I'm in the double C tuning, so you have the, you have to kind of do the bar chords like like that. But it, I just um, there's just like two two note. And it's like instead of taking the full bar chord here for the for the for the sixth for the minor, I just do the the root root note and the top note so it's not real it's like both it's 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 the one and the six if you want to be a little more like suggesting what it is you can just add the if you want to be like really explain it you do the whole chord but it's just kind of Itself, but it's just—I feel it's a good, good bed to have um, yeah. for singing. And because of the the banjo, I feel sometimes it's a challenge to uh, for banjo and singing that the banjo doesn't have amazing sustain. I mean, mm-hmm. it it has better sustain on days when I have you know you have to really have a good technique to to get good sustain out of a banjo. So to use some open strings here and there for me it's been really helpful so it's still you're still like a bed under the under the voice yeah if you could yeah if you play a full you know closed position chord up the neck while yeah, playing claw hammer really it can cool. get kind of it, it can you know you it can get kind of choppy you know and yeah. uh um there might be a place for it but it's nice to have that open string so it sounds fluid throughout throughout the whole thing that you're doing um, as a middle, when you're when you're writing a song, or and because you you're multi instrumentalist, um, how do you kind of decide in the end which instrument to use? Because I've seen you play sometimes play banjo on a specific song, sometimes play guitar on the, on the same song. But is there when you kind of when it's being your kind of your going into the recording process, or or it's just going to be your main way you're going to perform the song when you're playing it live? Is there you just kind of let it kind of you just kind of feel it what it's feeling which instrument is kind of working for this song is yeah i i, I mean i uh, that's a very interesting question and i i hope i have some kind of answer for it but i i do think it's like this when i 
when I write songs, there are certain instruments that could, where I, you know, you but I find the song and it's certain, like they could be like trying out a new tuning on the banjo and finding this, oh, there's a song in there. And, and then I write it on the banjo and maybe I'm, maybe I try it on the piano and I try it on different instruments, but, and then I record it on that, the instrument where I'm mostly, most excited to play at where, I, you know, where at that moment, because God knows I change my mind all the time. Uh, we're most excited to play. So I find it in one instrument, just because it could also be, um, it could be, yeah, it could be, sometimes it's just, you have you have an idea on one instrument and it's kind of okay. But then I try it on the piano and it just kind of evolves into something else. But the idea, it just, I love this weird process. And then I record it, but then live, it's just, which is later, and I've changed my mind, or I feel that the song, you know, is best at another instrument, but I don't know. But so, like the song I started with, Like the Wheel, I'm happy, I'm grateful I, I wrote that song for myself because it's a song that I can play on any instrument, it just works on any instrument, and I have some of those songs, and I feel that is, that's what I want to try to try to do to, to write songs that just aren't as great at any instruments. They're different songs, but like, like the wheel, I, I think there's a, there is a guitar version of that, like a demo recording of that that's released and a piano version and live. I played it on guitar, different like electric guitars, acoustic guitars, pianos, banjos. So, um, I don't know if that's a, it's all over the place, but they're the different instruments can, you know, they can, I don't know. I think it's a lot of, uh, it's really good for me because it's, I'm, I'm never like, I, I don't often get stuck in a, in a, in a rut because I, if I feel that I'm start, starting to play the same thing, I just jump to the next, just jump to the next instrument, just, hasn't been that beneficial for my, you know, to be super, I'm not a virtuoso on anything, but it's... Uh, I just wanted to comment on that if I can, and uh, pardon my, my technical jump in there, but um, one of... One of um, Certainly one of my favorite songs, and I, a couple of guys in the chat uh, echo this as well, Somewhere in the Mountains, Somewhere in New York. Um, uh, when you listen to the original recording, it's on acoustic guitar. Yeah, uh, and I think you've got some horn sections going on in the background yeah. to kind of add some color and some and, and some uh, uh, just some real nice textures to it. But there's a lot of performances on that we can find of you playing that song just yourself on the banjo, and yeah. uh, it's it's cool because you you pick up the horn section almost with the banjo as well. Kind of what Dave was saying, like playing up the neck a yeah. little bit. Um, and uh, I don't know about you, I just wanted to hear your thoughts on how you've. Do you prefer that kind of stripped back version? I, for, for me personally, the, the stripped back version of that song with just the banjo is it's glorious. It's just you and one instrument um, doing you know, the whole rendition. What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I'm not sure that I prefer either because I don't listen to them. I just play, <laughs> you know, I don't go back and, and, and listen to that. But I, I, I just feel there are, <sighs> there's a time and a place for for, for different versions. I mean, that, I remember that recording of the of the guitar and, and, and horn um, version that we recorded out here in the studio here. I was oh, wow. pretty heartbroken and just wrote that song really fast. And my friend, my friend CJ Carmeri, he was here over here from, from the States with all his horns and just recorded that, like, because there was, just that kind of I mean, that's sound that's not definitely not how all my songs are written and it's not i don't live a super sad life but <laughs> that was just like that song just came and kind of saved the day for me instead of just like moaning about shit you know it's like i wrote that song so that that is really special to me <clears throat> and then um i've been playing it like i played it like that a little live but yes you said i do and then I do miss CJ. Like, CJ, where the hell are you? He's playing with 
Paul Simon. Why are you not playing? <laughs> <laughs> but it's just that I do I because I hear because CJ has played horns on a bunch of my recordings and when I play songs I hear I hear CJ even when I'm live so I kind of hum them to myself and but so yes you're that's a very good observation because that's just what I'm trying to do I'm trying to get you know some of, some of CJ in there so do you find the banjo helps you uh, achieve that more than any other instrument, like being able to incorporate like the, the maybe some of those lead parts, but also keep the rhythm going at the same time. Is it is it better for you in that sense than maybe a guitar or, a, or another instrument? I think so too. Yeah, I mean the the electric guitar could you know could be a little like that once in a while because you can have like ambient effects on and you could have more sustained ringy things but then there's the banjo is pretty perfect because as you said rhythm you have the rhythm going and then you have this little guy who's just yeah. not shutting up just being there and creating that space and then you can yeah so you like when you can, when you can travel up the neck and you can you know it's absolutely yes yeah, that makes sense i like and, yeah awesome dave sorry to interrupt you carrying on no 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 Keep, keep keep coming in, uh, yeah. When you, early in your career, because you as a multi instrumentalist talking about that, how did you decide what instrument to bring on the road with you? Because um, just traveling as myself, you know, sometimes I play different types of instruments, different types of banjos and guitar, and so and yeah. it's sometimes you can only bring one, really, really maybe two, and uh, um, but but on, in your set, you're kind of thinking all. Oh, you know, in your ears, or if you could do it perfectly, you'd have all these different stuff going on. Well, um, early I didn't have the I, 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 I didn't have the decision to make because I, yes, I was just traveling, I was just touring by myself in the beginning, right. and I, I could, you know, and with all the guitar tuning. So I mean, there was one European tour where I was just like, I toured with a suitcase, a rolly suitcase, and two hard case guitars that were strapped together. Oh my God, I sound like an old man. Back in the day, I used to. But, <laughs> no, but that was like and like running to trains and stuff. And then you fast forward to now, where you know my crew hates me because like, yeah, on this tour I actually need fourteen instruments because. <laughs> so now, I mean, it's just it, it, it has turned into madness at some because I do to have the different options. I don't use all the fourteen, but maybe 11 at a show because of all the different tunings and all the different types of guitars and you know the banjo tunings i know for myself when i switch instruments on a gig uh or something with a different tuning it takes a second for my brain to click over sometimes i'll pick up and i'll you know I, I'll, to trick to get that look down and look at the strings and see this is this tuning do you ever have that that moment where you have to kind of like Get, get not, that not, to unlock the, 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 the next instrument because you're still seeing the past instrument in your head when you look down the strings. Uh, no, not often actually. It has happened sometimes where, um, where it's like I have a bunch of C tunings where there's like one string that's different from the next one, but it's usually a struggle like rehearsing for a tour. But something happens when I get into a tour. I don't switch out the set list too much out of on a tour the song can maybe move the songs around so I, I can kind of get that in my in my in my head because i kind of think of the i don't know how to explain this but I, I remember lyrics in images like to remember the lyrics there's like a little like one verse is like an image and it's mm -hmm. kind of the same with the guitar this the, the chord shapes because they're so it's kind of connected to the to the song I don't have to look at it so much because I know it's like mm -hmm. that kind of triangle and that kind of, and it's just, it's also in that imagery and there's colors and stuff and to remember that. But I've, I mean, I've had, but I had moments on, on stage where it's just brain just, because that, that happens with lyrics for sure. I have to ask yeah. the audience for lyrics sometimes and it can happen with tunings where there's like one, one string that's like the the fourth and the and the first string are kind of when they're when they're switched kind of so the shapes are similar but yeah sorry and yeah. how many different 
tunings do you use on the banjo generally? <sighs> a lot. Yes, but <laughs> I mean, mostly it's uh, it's double C and double C with the E on the on the drum, where you get the major third there because I think it's pretty. And uh, I've been getting really into the uh, what is that tune? Like an F tuning? It's F F D yeah. G C D. Is that what it is? Uh, because it just it's very it's very pretty. And I've been playing in Open D recently, uh, but not as many as on the on the guitar. I've played very little in standard G tuning on on banjo, even though I play that the, the similar one with the extra string uh, on guitar. But I just recently, like a week, I was just playing that a lot and it felt exotic and I think I started to write some songs. So that's the, for me, that's the, that's the, that's the, the fun part, the beauty of it. You can just find new and, stuff. And then I've seen you, you play with a capo a lot, both on guitar and, and banjo. And uh, yeah. I did see in another interview that was, you said it was because it was, you used to move around on stage a lot and you just like the shorter scale of the instrument. It wasn't because of, a sing of a, a key that you sang in. Yeah, I talk a lot. That was maybe maybe a little exaggerated, a little bullshit, but not so much <laughs> because like there is a thing with standing up and then being down here, and I mean the, the banjo is shorter, but like not a not a, not a super big guy, so it's just like it's kind of uncomfortable for me. It's just like more comfortable to be here on on a mm -hmm. guitar. And also, yeah, but mostly it's it's for um, for singing keys, which is sometimes problematic on on the banjo with you know with the drums. They have spikes in here that I had to try to modify to get because this banjo has been had nylon strings now for a while, so I had to get the spikes out to hold a nylon string. Is that a song here? That's, that was me. I moved. Okay. Okay. So I just, <laughs> I, there are mice in the kitchen, so I have a cat to go there. But um, it's yeah, it's it's a little problematic on the on the banjo. You have I feels like I have few. I can't just like slap a cap on up here because I'm also it's, it's right. Just, yeah. Would well, you want to play another tune for us right now? Yeah, I can do that. I can do that. Um, I kind of wanted to play. Just the um, the banjo song that got me into playing banjo. And I'm gonna start with a little Swedish folk music as an intro because I did that last spring when lockdown started. It was before I moved home from the states. I think I was a little homesick, so I was playing shit, trying to play some folk music from here, but. Not super good at it. So I'm just gonna play a little of that and then I'm gonna play an American song that we're just like gonna find a banjo. Yeah, that's pretty Oh, 
Got to unmute myself. Mute myself. Oh. <laughs> um, um, when you're when you're, when you're uh, playing ball hammer, do you use your index finger or your middle finger? Middle finger. Okay. And then are those are those fake nails that you have, or you've grown out your nails? Not at the moment. Now they are real nails, but that doesn't work for me on on tour, since I play, you know, I play strummy guitar and play that. Yeah. So after a while, they just break. So on. On tour, I'm just this little freak with plastic nails that I make myself and glue them on. And yeah. Wow. It's just, what do you make? What are they made out of? Just where do you, where do you get the plastic? Just, I mean, for I start. It started with me going to like nail salons because yeah. I had a lot. Of, I had a lot of problems. I, mean, I played, and my nails broke, and I had blood blisters, and I can so I just. I was in Denmark. I was in Aarhus, Denmark, and. I heard from the promoter that there was like a nail salon that was right next to where the where the classical musicians hung out, the concert conservatory. So he was really good, made amazing nails when I played. But then touring around the world is ending up at the strangest nail salons and not speaking the same language and <laughs> just like it's for guitar and just <laughs> and sitting with those fumes. So then I just figure out I can do that myself. So I bought the kits of that really gross acrylic stuff with the powder and super standing behind venue. This was like I remember like standing behind venues because the fumes were so and like around like the, the tour bus was it was dark and i was standing there mixing things in a white powder and just like security guards like what really are you just not going to hide your drugs better than that and it's like no <laughs> nails. but then um, i simplified the process so now i'm just gluing on the plastic base layer and i find and it it holds up for maybe two shows and then i have to glue on new ones so i probably have super glue chemicals, you know, all up my arm and into my little heart, but that's what you just gotta do. <laughs> Who are some other, um, you know, you've been inspired by so a number of old time Appalachian musicians, you know, Roscoe Hudson, Basque Lamar Lunsford, are there, who are some other musicians that really inspired you? Well, modern musicians, I, you know, my friend Phil Cook that I uh, toured with, he also, I met him around 2010, maybe, for time. he was playing in a band called Megaphone. His brother, his brother Brad Cook and uh, Nick Sanborn and Joe Westerlund. He's an amazing banjo player. He's an amazing everything. He just has music in his hands. He's, when he plays, he's an amazing piano player, Hammond B3 roots guitar but like 
it was hit like to see his um, Clawhammer banjo playing up close was just really, really eye opening and inspiring. And he's also very inspiring. Phil Cook, look it up, people. He's just it's a very amazing soul. So he's inspired me in many ways, both musically and um, you know as a person. And then other like contemporary players, said Jason Romero. The, the banjo maker, Romero Banjos, but he has a duo with uh, his wife and him. They have a duo, Ferris and Jason Romero, and he's just such a fantastic. I've never met the guy for real, but just like his, it's just so beautiful. Playing a lot of, a lot of nylon strung guitars, and it's just, it's just gorgeous. And how they play together. Yes, yeah, they're fantastic fun. musicians. Yeah. And, yeah, and his banjos are gorgeous as well. Yeah, I mean, I'm on the waiting list for one for it. can get it in 10 years. Uh, so, <laughs> but um, uh, but then I mean, those guys, you know, have tone for days and they're they are pretty much the same age as I am, a little older, but uh, then there's we found like recently like this really young girl, is it Nora Brown? She's yep. yeah, yeah. She's very young compared to us three, at least. Um, and I was watching videos of her, and it's kind of a bummer because I was living my apartment in in Brooklyn that I you know that I moved away from. It's pretty close to the Jalopy Theater, uh, where she's been playing a bunch. And just like something, watching video, I've been watching so many videos with her because there's she's so young and. Apparently going down to the south and learning from her family seems to be involved with meeting a lot of players. But there's something in her playing and just like being just those old. There's something with her energy in playing those that are just so inspiring. I think it, it is kind of like the 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 she's she's cap probably because she's not like grown into like the you know, the, the scared, grumpy people that some of us old adults are, you know, just like, she's just like, I, I've done, I did that too. And I, you know, and just seeing her, then I'm reminded, and then I can be that kid again and dive. It's just like, she's, she's playing those songs with in intensity and the beauty and just, it's just super inspiring to see her play. Maybe I can't, I can't, I can't watch a full video with her because I just need to go around and get the banjo and just try to figure out because she's, you know, this yeah, like I bought a fretless banjo too because she plays that as well. I'm just yeah, yeah. Just, I heard just yesterday or the day before, I think. Um, yeah, she's she's a fantastic player as well. Yeah. Well, talk a little bit about um, we did hearing live our last week on, on recording banjo and microphone, and I'm curious what your what microphone you like to use or microphone placement you like to use when recording yeah i need to i need to wa i need to watch that video because that is i actually struggle with it i think it's really hard the banjo and like nylon string banjo even harder for me to to get it <clears throat> to get it right because it's it can sound so amazing like right here it's a little you know a little kitten you're holding but then you record it it sounds it's evil because there's something with the, the percussive um, nature that I have a hard time taming. It's just like kind of uh, popping in the low mid. But I've been using uh, most of the uh, uh, Coles, Urban Lights, Coles 4038. It's my probably my go-to. And then I could maybe sneak some kind of condenser in there for it. And here, it's just like, it, I know it's cheating, but you know, stereo is easier than mono to not be so so harsh. So it's either um, one one ribbon and stereo condensers just for a little a little more clarity, or there's a stereo pair of uh, ribbons and just one condenser. And I I use this. What I have here is a. a that I like a lot. It's the ear trumpet labs and what Edwina? It's a mm -hmm. microphone. They're funky. They're steampunk. Those and, are really yeah, cool. 
Yeah. I like ribbon mics, and I have. I mean, I have the. I have the Royers. Have the Royers. Uh, like the Coles better. F f have been more successful. I've just bought a pair of Extinct Audio BM9. That I've been looking at for a long time. I haven't had the time. I just got them, so I haven't tried them yet. But as the Royer being, uh, you know, built on the old Bangles and BM5, and yeah. I had <clears throat> or BM, I had a BM3 for many years. That sadly now is kind of broken. Um, so I'm excited to see if these BM9s are closer to that. But yeah, so. I, I would need I need a ribbon in there to kind of tame it a little. That's very cool. Yeah, we we I mean you can watch the video. We we did a thing with Roya, so we 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 really like those guys. But there's a I mean mics are like banjos, right? There's there's different mics with different different situations and different uh, um, applications, if you will. But live as well, like I've seen a bunch of videos of you. You appear to be plugged in uh, yeah. with a cable. What is your what's your go-to kind of setup for for live performances, either uh, you know solo or on stage, uh, or on a bigger band setting? Uh, we've been trying so many so many different things, but right now what we landed on right now is we have the. Let's see if there's a little. Let's see if we can get you zoomed in a little bit. There there's there's a little, little cable there. There's the LR backs, the Piezo bridge. That just. So going through the head. Excuse me. Is that going through the head? Is yeah. It... Okay. Yeah. You know, you could you can change the head. I'm not precious about that. I even painted a bird one. Uh, yeah, uh, it goes through the head. You, you can have it here, but you know, aesthetically, you know, uh, it doesn't really. It's just it's a tiny hole, so and it still sounds like a banjo. Yeah. Uh, so doing that because I've had a lot of like contact. My, I mean, I when I was just gonna start playing. A banjo live more seriously, my amazing front of house. We were doing production rehearsals here, and it came with one of those DP, like amazing DPA mm -hmm. uh, little gooseneck microphones. Oh, yeah, 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 and they sound amazing. It's the best sound, but I just kept on hitting it. And because I <laughs> and just this really expensive microphone, just like getting it off the banjo. So then we started with like these contact microphones on the inside of the. Yeah. Yeah. The head and so but you get up to the bigger stage and his feedback and like I feel I feel sorry for my front of house that I, you know, <laughs> so so solo banjo on, on a on a big stage where I don't sit. I mean if I just sat down and I could like mic it up and it could work, but I am just like I want to run around and all that and treat it as like a I want it to it's a so, but he's a, but he's a, never complained. Treat it as like a. Oh, what's going on here? It's a, it's a, but he's oh, a, wow. the live stream started on my phone. Okay. All right. um, Technology is always glory. EQing it a lot. We've been trying different, like really f fancy modeling uh, preamp pedals and stuff, and but I've been using a, a what are they called? It's, Grace Felix Helix. Yeah. Felix, um, Phoenix. Yes. Phoenix. I think, I think you're right. Yeah. 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 Uh, that's been it's it's been working 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 well. Very cool. You you mentioned um, just now you, you know you're you're hitting the mic sometimes. I wanted to, to kind of pick up on that a little bit because your your performances are very lively. Would that be a fair statement? Yes. I think, even watching uh, the NPR Tiny Desk concert that you did, it's probably the most energetic Tiny Desk concert I've ever seen, I think. But which um, one? The, the first one? Uh, I honestly don't know. I don't. I didn't pay attention. Was there, to a, was there a horn player or was it just me? It was a horn player. I think that was... Uh, okay, yeah. yeah. So, uh, but you're just, just moving around so much in that in that little setting. Is that uh, something that kind of comes naturally to you when, you're, when you get up on stage and you're feeding off that audience and... Um, or is that something that kind of you're, you're consciously trying to make a part of your performance? I mean, I, I do, I do feel it's it's coming maybe even too too much naturally. Uh, I wish I could. I'm trying to sit down at the shows now. A couple. No, of, you got you can't. You gotta, you gotta, but I'm kind of still dancing. I'm kind of like my dancing a little butt on the stool and <laughs> doing things. But it's for the dynamic of the show. It's good if I sit down and just. But I, I don't know. It's I've never felt 
comfortable just standing in the middle of the stage, like putting my heels down. I never put my heels down. I'm kind of like a boxer and I'm on my toes. I'm running around because if I put my heels down and like close my eyes, that's just kind of weirder to me because I don't feel, I don't know how to explain this, and I'm not sure how to say this without sounding pretentious, but it's, <laughs> I don't feel, it, it feels kind of a bummer if I get the feeling people are there to just like watch me, like like that that is the the, the one-way communication of just like, I have something really special here. I was sad one day. I won't right. really hear it. Whereas I am there feeling that I, this is like the life hack that I'm just so happy from, that I can write sad songs and have like kind of happy triumphant shows together with people and we can laugh together and yeah. we can, because I know, I, I haven't, I haven't think I've gone through more breakups than like a lot of other people. It's just kind of the, the same, but since I'm a songwriter, that's the easiest thing to write about. Then it just, I have a lot of songs that are about that, but then I know that there's so many people out here that do the, they're doing the same thing. So it's, it's that to just like run around, like how are you like, and you get to do these things that you don't get to do mm. in a, normal setting look people in the eye like look and that's, it's beautiful things you get to look someone a stranger right into the eyes and of course i you know, i take advantage of the situation you know of I, course. yeah and it could be uncomfortable for some people but i want to, i mean i need to run around and be there with people and run up to them and kind of and then there's a a part of it is also uh, tactics for if they're if there's like a rowdiness or you need someone to be a little quiet, you, then you can like run around a little more and then you can stop and be dead still to do the dramatic changes in your set. And then, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, you're, you're feeding the energy, right? From the crowd and kind of giving them, it's, it's more than just the music, it's the show, right? And, and yeah. that yes. that's part of your show, whether it's just you on a stool with a mic or whether it's you with a full band uh, at a festival, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very obvious part of what you do and it, and it comes out in the music it's very cool i really like it um i was also curious you uh, i'm sure you've been asked this like a thousand times so i don't want to hover yeah, on it but you've obviously been, first uh, huh? yeah, I'm good. sorry Go <laughs> you've uh, you've been praised over the years for your kind of dylan-esque uh style your vocal style especially and then you know i, I think we can all agree that the, the, undoubtedly like uh, he's one of your your influences but when i saw you I think it was on the premier guitar rig rundown uh, yeah. video uh, and you pulled out the white telly and I, yeah. for, for some reason, my head went straight to Jeff Buckley. Okay. And, and I was like, I wonder how much Jeff Buckley isms there are in, in his mind and in his music. Has that played a role in, in your kind of inspiration over the years uh, as he, should I say? Yes, but not major. I would say okay. I was, I was maybe I, I was going through my Jeff Buckley face. And I was a little too young or like I wasn't yeah. really, I don't know. I kind of didn't really stick to that. I mean, I do. Jeff Buckley just great. But <laughs> it just amazing. popped in my head. I was like, "That's cool. That's an iconic look. White telly with a you know young guy we're playing. It, it's just a rad yeah, thing." Yeah, it's also Mike, Mike Bloomfield and Dylan's band. So yeah, it, what's your what's your favorite Dylan album? Oh, that's a tough one. That's a tough I know, one. That's why I asked it. Yeah, I mean, I there's 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 so many different ones, but I mean, Time Out of Mind was very important yeah. to me like when it came out but then you know also blood on the tracks the the new york sessions <laughs> the boot, like it's love that i love new morning as well new morning was cool blood on the tracks was mine that was a yeah. great album yeah it's just it's, it's it's so good and i'm yeah there's so and of course i love the the the, the first one with all the those those classic just folk songs they were just way cooler than all the other folk songs it was just like didn't have much interest in many other of those that those kind of like 60s greenwich village years of, as a thing it's just like i just saw bob doing something different because it was kind of like it was kind of rock in there so he definitely changed the planet and he? He, he did, uh, did good things um i'm going to do a couple of questions from uh 
from the chat here, if you don't mind. Oh, cool. Okay, there's definitely a few people asking about the bird on your banjo. Who painted it? Was that? I think you just alluded to a minute ago that it was you. Was that your own uh, your own art? Yes, I'm a terrible I'm a terrible painter, but that turned out pretty good. I was just I was was one. Uh, I was in upstate New York where I was for the first eight weeks of the pandemic. So I just you know I like birds. I like birds, even though they're not real. And I have a bird here that this is. Oh yeah. One of my friends made, and yeah. That's cool. This one, yeah, it's, I drew it with three different sharpies, four different sharpies: black, silver, and two kinds of gold. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, we have we have a few artists that we work with that um, you know, they they paint or they draw, and we we definitely encourage it for those that want to do a bit of bit of. It's a perfect canvas, right? The banjo head. For it some, is. Uh, for some creativity and some self-expression, if you will. Yeah, because you know you need to switch them out. I say, well, anyway, and you can if you fail, you can you can kind of switch it out. So, but you can't. It's that's, that's harder on the guitar. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, all right, let's see. Sam Weber asks, Sam? how do you think being a young clarinetist influenced your future ba uh, banjo, guitar, and piano styles and arrangements versus having jumped straight into one of those instruments? It's a good question. That's a very good question. Um, I don't know. It, the clarinet, but then also I do, like, together with the classical guitar training, and then I also went to music high school, I do feel, even though, like, my songwriting and learning playing is kind of, like, wild and wacky and going to different tunings and stuff, I do... I am, I feel grateful that I had years of like learning some <clears throat> music theory, not to just like make rules from it, just like it's like with them, um, maybe this doesn't apply so much to the clarinet. And I do wish that I, you know, stuck a little more to, 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 to play clarinet well, because, but anyway, music, th like what's it, when I, but it's also in, in on banjo and open tunings on guitars to just know like chord analysis to know, you know, a one chord and a four chord and a fifth five chord because then when I'm just in a brand new tuning then it's just like, oh this is a cool this is a cool five chord, this is oh this tuning has kind of a weak six chord, so like let's not focus on that and so I. Yeah, and like, and, it, and that it, it, it is a musical to have some kind of musical language to talk. Like now, I've been like it's CJ that I've been talking about the horn player, and I did an EP with the, the sextet that he's in. Why music? With these extremely talented people, who went to Juilliard and they're masters at their their instruments to just have some some language to to easier to you know, to talk about intervals and stuff like that. Uh, you, you mentioned earlier on that being in, in um, uh, Sweden as well, that you have music as a foundation in school, right? Yeah. I mean, I know the answer for myself, but, and I think everybody else does, but how important is that just do you, from your, from your standpoint of having a real solid musical kind of foundation in a, in a young age kind of school setting do you think because uh, i mean in, here in the us it's not it's not great you know uh, music education is one of those things that really kind of gets the axed uh, from school budgets and that kind of thing and we hear a lot of stories about it and even our uh, a trade organization nam they're, they're constantly uh, lobbying uh, congress for more music education in the, in the us so how does that compare how, how important is that do you think for, for for a young child coming up in the in school I mean, it's just, I mean, it's, uh, I can go on about this. It's a super big, big subject because also they're cutting it here as well, you know, because, okay. it, you know, capitalism, like, you know, it's not super intelligent. I haven't figured out that culture is actually can be driving for innovation and stuff like that. Right. Don't get me started. But <laughs> I, don't, I don't know, I don't know how important it is because, you know, you, there's amazing musicians that never had you know musical training uh, but i do feel like per capita or whatever here and like they're a very small country and there's a lot of 
a lot of musicians here and a lot of great songwriters and and uh, that so i think that is is showing that encouraging it encouraging encouraging it from a young age uh, more so with boys than with girls uh I mean, yeah, I mean, that is also another thing where, you know, you're, you're, you're a rowdy kid in school and it's just like, but you play in a band. I remember that, but I wasn't that rowdy. I was, <laughs> I was a little rowdy, but I had this weird, I, I got my grades anyway. Yeah. And it was recent, but there's, you know, you're, you're rowdy, but, but, but then you're, then you're playing in like in this like punk band, like at least, at least he's, he's kind of a shit kid, but at least he's doing something creative playing with a band where it's like a girl in that age, you know, playing in a punk band it's like oh no like it's just, it's just, there's something like this trouble trouble <laughs> so that's a that's a sidetrack it's a sidetrack but i i do I mean that it's that's it's, it's amazing like feel like we could like in our you know in junior high you know you could sneak away to like a not sneak away like and go away when it was recess and go to like a little rehearsal room and just like grab the instruments and just like go for it for a while and then you know you didn't get into trouble maybe yeah. music instead so yeah absolutely yeah. Couldn't, couldn't i had that, that in skateboarding too <laughs> and it, it i i feel yeah I, I feel i feel very blessed and, and lucky that i that i had that growing up yeah no i think that's cool that's cool it's, it's an important thing and i might you know my kids i'm One's doing guitar, the other, my seven-year-old's doing banjo. I've mentioned that before, and it's just, it, it gives them a little bit more of an outlet, even if they're just basic level, you know, they're just starting yeah. out, they're just trying to find their way, but they, they're really curious about, you know, finding notes and trying to figure out how to play a, a twinkle, twinkle, little star or something like that, and it's cool. It's, amazing. You know, it's really cool. Um, all right, but a few more questions. How are you doing for time? I wanted to check, make sure you're okay. Are you Well, I am. sick of us yet? In this house, I am mom and I'm dad and I'm a kid, and so I'm making the rules. I can be up as late as I want. So excellent well. stuff. Well, we'll make sure you don't get you get some sleep tonight. You get get to bed relatively early. You know it's going to be fine. What is your favorite song to play on the banjo? Asks Caitlin Ryder. My favorite song to play on the I think that is uh, I know that it, <laughs> it's actually I don't really know how to play it. As well. I'm just gonna play a snippet of it, don't worry. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. No, what, is so what, what are you tuning up to now? Is that. No. Playing to the F, the F tuning? Okay. It's like the Cumberland Gap tuning? Yeah. yeah. It's Lost Lula. It's not with, with Fair Jason Romero, so it's. I'm gonna play along. I want to learn it one day. Yeah, okay, I don't know it. It was Lost Lula with Ferris and Jason Romero. It was That's pretty good. Favorite. Yeah, yeah I, I, I used to play like a year ago. I tried to learn it, and now I'm going to learn it proper one day. Awesome, awesome. Uh, Livia asks, how do you feel writing your lyrics in English? Does it come naturally? You seem to have a pretty good command of the English language, probably better than me, uh, and I am English. So um, how, does, how does the lyric writing come about uh, for you uh, in, in not your native tongue? Yes, but it, it's, it's, it's a really good and understandable question. Um, I think early on, and also like consuming so much, uh, like we start with English really early in school. We do. Yeah. But then also we have the American sitcoms and you know British shows yep. uh, on on TV. So we're really like in contact with it from early years. But then I was just like, I'm a daydreamer, and I just like I started to write songs, and also like listening to mostly. Uh, music written and sung in in English that like if I write songs like daydream of playing on stages I want to go to a bunch of places and go far if I would sing in Swedish I would 
they play in Sweden, Norway, and Denmark, maybe, and they would, yeah. they would, they would get it. So that's the. <laughs> Uh, that's why I started. That's not the how it feels to write in English. Uh, in the actually gotten a little, it's gotten easier and harder. It's, this is kind of the, the curse of learning a language more because, I mean, before moving home last year, I was mostly living in America for the last five or six years yeah. and touring there and in Australia and uh, in the UK and Europe since 2007. Um, but in the beginning of just like not be, I wasn't that great at English or didn't have all the words. So I did a lot of grammar mistakes that I didn't sure. know of, but I just like, I had this freedom. I could just like be kind of reckless with this, with this, uh, language of just like making up metaphors that maybe weren't used that often in English and kind of mm -hmm. switching things around and then learning more and like, living there it's just now i know more now i know more what's wrong so yeah. now sometimes i just can't be that just like free flowing because <laughs> it, it makes perfect sense yeah it's, it's always impressive to, to to see someone who's whose first language is not necessarily english sing uh and talk uh as fluently as you do like it's it's very good so we thank you for that because you know, we would, you know, otherwise would maybe not have heard of uh, of the music as much. So it's awesome. A um, couple more questions for you. They're, they're they're heating up now in the in the chat. You can probably see. Yeah. Uh, Jean Luc Lepage um, asks, yeah. when you try writing a song, what comes to you first, the chords or the tuning? Uh, good question. It differs. Um, you like to noodle, right? Am I am I right in saying yeah. that? When, yeah, when I, like to, I, like to, I like to noodle, but like noodle songs, like noodle chord things. Like it's like I never like noodle like a Grateful Dead song. I'm not <laughs> a jam band guy. Um, I like to find, and that is, it kind of comes in the same. Like I don't know. Sometimes I can use, I can noodle around in a new in a new tuning and, and find stuff and that is just like making a song because you kind of you can kind of it's that exploration the cur curiosity of finding a new world that is a new song yeah that, that in, in a new tuning but then sometimes i from i've been playing for a while i know i'm playing in, in one tuning and like no i know the fourth chord is way cooler in that so then yeah then it's the chords, and I have the chords down, and I know, but I know I'm not in the right. I don't have the right vibe down yet, and yeah. the right vibe not might not be another tuning. It might be a piano or an accordion. There yeah. it is. Yeah, I love it. I love it. All right. Uh, from the north is asking, what are your preferences in terms of pot size and tone ring? Which we haven't really touched on the banjo too much. Um, no, uh, no. This this one is pretty straightforward. It's just a, yep. what do you call that little, just a regular. There's a bigger, uh, I think it's an old time wonder with an 11 inch rim, it looks like. Yeah. From here. Yeah. 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 I do tend to like 11s, uh, a little uh, better for, for myself. It's just something about getting a little more clarity yeah. in it. Uh, and, um, I don't know what I prefer. I mean, in terms of tone rings, I haven't tried them all. I haven't tried them all. I have a, I have a banjo with a Dobson in, in, that's in, in America. I have a lot of things that are still in America because I have to leave the country pretty quick and like we're in a weird yeah. way moving out of an apartment. So I have a lot of things in storage over there that I can't go back to. So uh, I am not that much of an expert in different tone rings, no. But, fair enough. Yeah. yeah. We, you, but you sound like you're still experimenting. It sounds like you're still trying to work your way through kind of different options and uh, different rim sizes and stuff to see to see what you like. And yeah, but it's something I've been trying, like, and, and trying different banjos. Somehow it always like lands on like that. The 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 eleven inch feels a little easier for me to manage in terms of clarity, mm -hmm. and maybe it has something to do with like singing to 
Mm -hmm. Even though it would be, I appreciate some more bass once in a while, but yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Very cool. Well, the the questions are coming in thick and fast now. Uh, so are, yeah. are you still good on time? It's, it's only 9... 920 and I, all right I, we're, we're gonna keep going we're gonna answer as, yeah. as many as we can i'm gonna make myself comfortable here you ready yeah all right this is a good question right this one uh later oh. i hope i'm pronouncing it right later darby uh how often do you play or write songs outdoors in nature thank you for the beautiful music i as often as i can i love it i actually i love it but then as much as I love this place where I live, <laughs> it's uh, it has been pretty cold lately. I don't do it in winter, uh, but I l absolutely love to do it in the summer to sit outside and um, actually and also record demos outside because then you get the little birds and all that. And mm -hmm. I've started now because this spring has sprung a little here. The snow just melted. There's been some hot days, and I have this. I have a barn. Where I can on the second floor, I can open some barn doors. Nice. Yeah. And I, and I sit there and I sat there the other day and kind of it was really it got like, really toasty. I'm sitting in a t shirt. And yeah, I feel it's it, and it, that barn. I love it. I have a pump organ on the second floor there. That, oh, wow. Yeah. I, it was my project. Come, I, when I flew home from America uh, last year, I was just, and no one knew what so I just put myself in like, strict quarantine not seeing anyone just not even going to the store for two weeks uh so, so i then took up the project of getting the pump organ to the second floor by myself cool. because i really wanted it up there it was really nice weather so i picked it apart i took it apart in small pieces and i built it together again on the second floor and it's amazing i can sit there in the summer <laughs> and we're saying i the neighbor's kids like there's a there's a house they're they're only they're they only have us a summer house, but one of their kids is a little scared of he he calls me playing the organ for ghost music. So Oh wow. <laughs> but it's, it's the question. I love it's just it's the it's the it's the I, I mean I, I I grew up thirty minutes from here and it's to explain it's just on the countryside, kinda looks like Vermont in America and there's a lot of the rivers and uh, evergreen trees, spruce trees. Uh, the mountains so it mm -hmm. was my playing playing field as a kid so oh, it wow. is um, that it's it's it is very inspiring to me to sit outside and, and uh, practice and you know i don't have a lot of body fat i'm just this weird little animal that's just kind of a cat i just find a, a sunny spot and i sit there and i just feel toasty and that's, that's awesome yeah, nature's nature's a beautiful thing when it comes to music. I, I love it. Um, all right, so Molly and O'Keefe, Molly O'Keefe, I apologize. Um, let's see, who's someone you've loved working and performing with? Oh, oh it's just so many of these. You've yes, worked with a few people, huh? You, there's been a number of guys that you've kind of collaborated with, or you've been. I saw you on uh, Chris Teal. Um, oh my god. That was cool. That looked yeah. like you were having a lot of fun. I mean, that was just, I don't know. I, <laughs> I love him and we used to live in the same same neighborhood in, oh, in, in Brooklyn, but haven't had time to, to play that much. I mean, he's super busy and he's like yeah. a wizard of music. But when I did that thing, the, um, that show, he asked that I play that. We only rehearsed Somewhere in the Mountains, just a couple of maybe not even a full run through and then we start to play and he just shreds and yeah he does i you know i feel like a you know everyone has imposter syndrome feelings but like with him actually knows his way around and I, like, but something happened with me i just felt like christian you just need to like step up like two two steps higher than your best <laughs> like play and but i mean probably because of him, it was kind of locked in and played. And that was, that was amazing. And I, I do, I mean, I have ideas. I mean, I'm working on new stuff and I need to try to get Chris to play on some of that because that would be super cool to do something like that. But I love, I love performing with others and like, especially with singers and like yesterday I was 
playing this live streamed award show and I got to say with my dear friend Amanda Bayman, who yeah. I've also been briefly married to. Uh, but we're just great friends today. That is someone and but we just there's something about when we sing together, it's just like our, our voices just kind of work. And then yeah. the tour that started uh, just as the pandemic started, we did we did, did two shows in Chicago before the rest of the tour was up. That was when I had Court Marie Andrews uh, wow. opening up and she sang a little with me and that was oh. magical. So wow. I get to you. What with some amazing people. I think that's awesome. There's, there's so many amazing people out there. So I mean, I, I, I yeah, I at Newport Folk Festival two years ago. I got to sing uh, uh, Joni Mitchell playing wow. play the banjo, play the banjo coming yeah. from the cold, and I was singing with the with the women in the Mountain Man the band. Wow, and that, was, that was back in 1957. We used and oh. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. I miss them so much. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get on an airplane to North Carolina as soon as they let me. Absolutely, yeah. We we just kind of we started getting word just the last couple of days that there's, there's some festivals that we typically attend uh, that are planning to go ahead later this year. So it's all, I don't know. Things seem to be kind of warming up a little <laughs> I, bit, and and I know we'll I see. have, I have some st some stuff in in the fall. That they're just saying it's gonna happen, but I. Having gone through a year of so many like hypothesis planning and what yeah. might happen, I'm just like I'm too scared to have any hopes. But not, I mean, I'm, 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 it's 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 gonna happen. But I'm just so scared. So, okay. There's a vaccine shortage in here. Like I just need to get my vaccine then. And I it's just like, yeah. but I yeah. So Bed back up and run. It's it's gonna happen. It's gonna happen. It's gonna happen. Uh. It's gonna be. It's gonna be. I mean, amazing. Just to be like, yes, festivals, but like to be, to be near people, to laugh, to, to laugh together. Yeah. Be Going back on stage for the for the first time uh, after this, you know, when things start to come back, I wonder if it will compare to you know those those first times. You know, as musicians, I've done it. You obviously do it a lot more than I do, but. Getting up on stage for the first time, you get those those big butterflies, and I wonder if that that feeling will come back because that's. You can't really beat that. That's kind of the cool part of just getting up on stage and you know, your nerves are going crazy and you're trying to just be excited and everything. I wonder if that's going to be the same vibe after not playing for a year. I think it is because I actually had, I mean, I had a taste of it because in uh, September last year, mm -hmm. where, you know, we thought that the pandemic had gone on for a long time, but the numbers around this area was really low. So we were allowed to have uh, gatherings of, 50 people to do oh, shows. Okay. 50 people. So had these shows in a barn for 50 people, three nights. And uh, no one got sick. Thank God. Uh, it was just, per but then, and uh, Amanda Bergman and Clara Söderberg from the uh, band First Aid Kit. Yep. They were, they were playing first. And I just, I had geared up for it and just like I've been missing playing live so much and like I'm so excited to get to play again. But then I realized that I also been missing listening and watching live music as a as an audience. So when they started singing, I just started crying. I just started crying like wow. this is, this thing is amazing. And it was in this little bar and like the people that were there that also been it was so emotional, this whole thing. And Getting on stage, and I was just like, "There's, there's no question. Like this is, this is my passion. This is what I need to do." And yes, the nerves were there, but the good nerves. They're not yeah. the nerves. They're just like the, the, the life, the ad adrenaline. Absolutely. Yeah. Playing, playing too fast, uh, talking too much in between songs, and forgetting lyrics, and all of that. And it just felt great, and it felt. To me, it feels like a lot of, a lot of vanities. Even though I don't think I've been, like, don't ask my crew, but that I've been <laughs> much of a princess or a, a diva. But there, are like, there are, like, some. I feel now there is vanity of just like I don't want to play that. 
uh, uh, choosing between venues. I don't play that because that one is not as, you know, not as good as that one. And like, I can't tour longer than three and a half weeks. Just, you know, that is, uh, or I can't like, I need some days off here and there, which you do, but there's some yeah. stuff that were just like, Oh, I was just comfortable because like, I am, give me a, give me a pizzeria, give me a pizza place. And I play there. Absolutely. I feel that right now. <laughs> That's awesome. I'm excited to have live music back. Um, I'm going to do a couple more here for you. Um, yeah. All right. So Daniel Weisser asks, uh, yeah. both your YouTube series were such beautiful projects. Do you, do you see yourself doing similar projects again? Please, can you do similar projects again? <laughs> Apparently, that was a popular one. Yeah. No, I thank you. Thank you, Daniel. They were very, very, very fun to, to, to do also very very time consuming and being a you know curious nerd as i i wanted to like do all that and fit, i took like a little break from it was a year where i didn't where i didn't tour so that's when i started to do them and like how can i like do other things and i didn't know much about video making so i just did all of it and editing and all that and, it was just so much work, so it's kind of nice to take a to take a break from it. I'm gonna do I'm gonna do something similar, I, but I just started to do. I'm gonna, I actually that's where I have very talented friends and my yeah. dear friend Rolf Nilinde that I've done some stuff with. Now we did actually did a documentary about um, those shows in the barn, Little Red Barn show. Oh. So for, for, for a while last. Um, winter when we had like a you could buy tickets to see it but now we soon we're gonna try to get it out into the world again he, right. he's just super funny and talented and so to collaborate with i'm think i'm gonna do that for a while to collaborate with him on we did a, we did a short one that's up on youtube a couple of weeks ago when he came here and, and vi to visit it's pretty wacky but it's uh, <laughs> it's fun it has some snowboarding in it but i'm awesome. also happy playing a full song and you can hear me play pedal steel and drums and uh, -huh. uh what, what was that called again it's just it's on my youtube channel it's called something like uh, the tallest man on earth has cabin fever oh yeah yeah, yeah. I, I saw that i didn't watch it yet but uh, i did see that yeah. pop up on my, on my so yeah. if you if, was, it, was it daniel i think uh, uh dan yeah yeah daniel. you can watch that see if you see if you like that and it's like it's little stuff like that i'm gonna do for a little while but if you think that sucks just tell me and i'll you know i could it's gonna be because i do i do feel it's it's it's, it's a good thing to, to reach a lot of people like around the world where i can't travel but after like to be honest this last year of just i love this this is great this is actually probably the best live interview most ah. fun I've, I've i've done um where it just <laughs> this this format is fun because i get to talk about dan just yeah but uh it i am just like really like what we do, were just talking about just like to get out there and just to actually see people and to play and to try to go to those places where i haven't been and and do that so when the world opens up again, I'm going to focus on that too for a while. But Wait, when you come over to the U.S. again, and uh, yes. you make it down to Southern California, we we will welcome you with open arms. So, to oh, come should I play? and now I have to be true to my word. Uh, yep. Playing anywhere? Should I play the? Is that still around the Casbah? Is that, is that wasn't Casbah? Um, I, I'm pretty sure they closed, but I don't think it was before. I could be wrong. I don't want to. I don't want to misspeak. No, I, I think I remember that. that was like, as long as people who don't know, that was a rock club in, yeah. in San I Diego. Yeah, and I played a couple of times, and you could hear the the airplanes. Yep, they were coming in. You was like you're on stage, and like. <laughs> well, it's downtown San Diego, and if you stand outside on the corner of the Casbah, as most bands tend to do before before their showtime, and I've done it many times, they come right over, super super yeah. low, right over that corner. So you yeah. can look up, kind of like in Wayne's World, you know that movie where they're like yeah. on the car, it's going over the plane. <laughs> yeah, it's terrifying. But uh, it's it's um, it doesn't you can't hear it inside, which is great. Yeah. Um, cool. Right. Go ahead. Go ahead. So yeah. Um, one thing I wanted to kind of I know she she's written a couple of times, and this is a, probably a good place to kind of kind of end. I thought this was great. Um, Grace Lernberger, she wrote this 
quite early on in the chat, and I wanted to save it till last because I thought it was um, it was really nice. But she wrote, not a question. When I heard the banjo in My Dear, I cried at how beautiful it was. I bought my banjo after falling more deeply in love with it while watching Christian's Friday concert last spring. Aww. And so she says a huge thank you. She was on the other chat as well. She said the same thing. And so, and, I, and I've seen a few people today kind of just commenting similarly. Um, you're, you're an inspiration to a lot of people. And I think that's really cool and, and an absolute pleasure to talk to. So. Yeah, but I wouldn't be much of a if it weren't for for you and for all these people in the chat. It would be like the Zen thing, like you hear, hear a, what is it? Hear, hear a tree falling in the woods if no one's there. But you know, that, right. does it make a sound? Yeah, That's yeah, cool. does it make a sound? Like what well, my songs are, they're they're nothing. They're that that bear grace. It's just like it's kind of the the fuel. Maybe I mean I mean I am that. Maybe it should be more romantic than that but that's the simple animal i am then just like you like that okay i'll make another one it's just like it's make another one <laughs> i love it well listen christian it's been a it's been a real fun episode uh i'm dave uh dave had a couple of technical issues uh so we we had to drop out but uh okay, thankfully thank you, uh he'll come thank back again are. next week but um hoping that you can play out with uh with, with a special song, hopefully. Yeah, you know what you got. It was a heartbreaking song for you. Yeah, it was. I was there. I felt it. <laughs> so to everybody watching, thank you, as always, for tuning in. This was a great episode. It's going to be up almost immediately on YouTube for you guys to rewatch. Um, tune in uh, next Thursday, um, and we'll see you again soon. Christian, thank you for joining us. Everybody, the tallest man. On Earth. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, you're so welcome. And I'm gonna play. I'm just not gonna. I'm gonna tune. But I can't say it's just a little tip. Like with, I'm not gonna play my dear. I'm gonna play another song, but I'm mean, gonna I mean the double C tuning, the C G C D. But this is usually G in that. But if I tune it down to an E. Major, just stuff like that. Tune the drum string to something else because it can, you know, you can, can play the pretty much the same thing you did, but it kind of changes the mood of the whole thing, and you don't have to, you know. And here you, you get this. You don't get the G. Okay, I'm gonna shut up and play. Thanks for listening.
till the daylight comes around. I'll be fine, it's all I really own, it's always been around. Hanging on a dream of you, I will fall for days. Getting late. Now we we'll sing a song. I wrote, but please don't take your love away. Thank you so so much that was magnificent christian enjoy stay safe you too hope to see you in san diego absolutely thank yeah. you guys be safe